All right, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, my name's Ant Duro, and I'm the head of uh, digital growth here at AMP. And I've got to admit, I'm feeling pretty chuffed about the role I've got, um, given all of the great speakers we've seen over the last couple of days. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here, and especially a, a warm welcome to our special guests, all the staff, the media, and in particular to the online community who's going to be streaming this and, and watching this from all over the world. Um, we're very lucky here t today to have Professor Michael Norton, who, um, who I was trying to work out how we introduce him, and he did say he could, I could introduce him as a jailbreaker, but he said people have got to kind of get that joke. Um, but uh, he's a behavioural scientist um, here from Harvard Business School, and he's here to talk to us about how money can buy happiness. Now, one of the things that I'm very jealous of, of, of Michael is that he's recently done a whole lot of TED Talks, and his TED Talks got over 3.5 million hits on YouTube. So that's something that um, I've definitely aspired to try and do, and I'm, and I'm very jealous of him being able to do. Um, so, guys, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to get Michael up here to have a chat to you about the edge of behavioural science. I was saying that um, most of the uh, hits on YouTube are my mom just hitting reload, so it's not really that, uh, that impressive. She retired, so she has time. So um, I want to start with, a if you'll just humor me and play a little thought experiment with me for a second and answer this question uh, in your mind. If you found $20 in the street today, how would you spend it to make yourself happiest? And really actually answer the question in your mind. So think, like you're outside after this, you find $20. And I told you, you have to spend it in a way that would make you really happy. Think for a second what comes to mind, what you would do. Does anyone want to share their audience appropriate example of what they would do with the money? Yeah? Give it away to someone? Other, other ideas? Yeah? Buy my wife some flowers? Did you do something wrong today? Is that why you? <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Want to share? Chocolate cake. Yes. Post it on Facebook. I think that's an interesting one. So Bitcoin. Yeah. So um, probably a lot of you. Th these are examples that, that um, are not uncommon. So probably a lot of you thought the first thing you thought of was. Um, giving it somehow, like either giving it away or uh, treating someone you know to something, uh, like buying flowers or just giving it away. And then a lot of you also probably thought about something kind of special, uh, like chocolate cake or, or something like that, that you're kind of excited about. So hold that one in your mind for just a second. And now also answer this question for me. For how, raise your hand if your answers to those two questions were exactly the same. Two, three, maybe four or five out of however many people are in the room. That's a pretty typical uh, percentage. Probably most of you for this question thought about like something you had to buy today because you just, so you had to buy something. Uh, and what, uh, really this is kind of the fundamental thing in all of our research that we do, which is these two worlds of money. Uh, and it turns out that when we ask people the second question that I just asked you, that's like life, which is just sort of, well, money comes in and money goes out and I spend it on stuff. But if I ask you the first question, you typically think of things that are different from your answer to the second question. And of course, like I'm sure some of you thought of, you know, you had to pay for parking or you bought lunch. Like, of course, we have to do those things. It's not crazy. But the idea is that we spend too much of time and money down in the bottom question and too little on the top question. And the other thing that's interesting is, and I'll share the research that we've done, um, a lot of the things that we come up with that actually make you happy with your money, this top world, they're not incredibly surprising. So you just came up with some things like, well, giving it away sounds good, or doing something special sounds good. It's not that we don't know them, it's just that we don't do them. So I don't have magical secrets of money that you're not aware of. In a sense, the problem is that we just exist down at the bottom and not on the top. And I want to talk about the research we've done, which is why we end up in our lives being down at the bottom, and then what are some ways that we can spend a little bit more time um, up at the top. So um, this is the phrase that I try to start every, uh, that should say happiness with an S. I do know how to spell. Um, hap happenies. It's a um, Portuguese word. No, it's not. 
Uh, money can buy happiness. So you probably have heard this before. It's in every world religion in some form or another, like money's not the key to a happy life either here or elsewhere. Um, every self-help book has a chapter, it's usually like chapter seven or something, called Money Can't Buy Happiness. You might have a friend who says things like this to you. Think of him or her. Usually they do a lot of yoga. <laughs> Often they're extremely wealthy, so it's really <laughs> annoying if they say anything like this. Uh, and I want to suggest it's kind of right and it's, and it's kind of wrong. So it's, it actually is true that the way we typically spend our money does not pay off in very much happiness. And I'll talk a little bit about that depressing fact. But then I'll also talk about actually that there are other ways that we can use our money that do pay off in more happiness. So a little bit of a cheesy phrase, but it's one that I call to mind a lot in my own life, which is if you think money can't buy happiness, it just means you're not spending it right. And what we try to do is think about uh, business as usual, the bottom world, and then uh, other things we can do with uh, our money. So before I tell you the ways that actually do make us happy, let's just spend a little bit of time on the things that don't make us happy so we can see where we're going um, wrong. By the way, when I say we always, I'm including me. So a lot of the research we do, it comes from uh, looking at ourselves. Sometimes it's looking at family members. Sometimes it's looking at ourselves and saying, why did he do that or why did I do that? trying to understand it and then figuring out if we can do better uh, in, in our own lives. So um, what do we usually do with our money? So uh, interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, there was an um, article on CNN where they chatted with me and my co-author, Liz Dunn, about uh, money and happiness. And it might be a little hard to read in the back, but the title of the article was, Winning the Lottery, colon, Does It Guarantee Happiness? Question mark. If you know how headlines work, what that means is the answer is no. Otherwise, it'd be a stupid headline if the answer were yes. <laughs> it's surprising that the answer is no. And in fact, the entire article was about people who won the lottery who ended up completely miserable. Like story after heartbreaking story of people who got all this money and then they ended up very, very sad. This is the McDaniel family uh, pictured here, which is one of the uh, couples that they talked about. They were a happily married couple. They lived in a town they liked. They both had jobs they liked. They got along well with their kids. They'd been married for a long time. Then they won, as you can see from the enormous check, $5 million in the lottery. And one year later, they were completely miserable. So um, I'm not like super good at math, but let's do a little math thing. So great life plus $5 million equals worse life. It doesn't seem to make much sense. And probably most of you were like, hmm, 5 million, I could definitely do a lot with that. What do you think happened to the McDaniels over the course of the, of the year? Any guesses? Taxes. <laughs> Taxes, yes. So typically when you win, the, at least in the States, you actually win about half the amount, but people often spend more than that half. Other things that happen? Yeah. Many more new friends. Probably you mean new friends in quotes, meaning uh, everyone in the world. By the way, in the United States, in order to redeem a lottery uh, winnings, you have to agree to be in the media so that people see people with enormous checks. And then we all are like, oh, I could do that, and we buy more lottery tickets. So literally, everyone in the world knows you're rich. Everyone you've ever met reaches back out to you. They're like, hey, how's it going? Give me some money. <laughs> and even worse, actually, everyone that you're close with starts to think of you as money. We interviewed a lottery winner who said, I started to feel like I was a walking dollar sign where everyone just basically saw me as money and wanted money. What else do you think happened to them? Quit their job. Quit their job. Of course you quit your job. You can finally go into work and tell your boss exactly what you think of him or her, and then storm out with like theme music playing. You know, it's amazing, which is great for that day, except even though a lot of us complain about our jobs, they're actually kind of good for us. We get things done. We feel like we're accomplishing something. Some coworkers irritate us, but other coworkers actually are our friends, and now we don't see them anymore. What else did they do? They moved. Of course, you buy a new awesome house because you're rich. The problem with moving is now they left the community they were in, and now they live in a very big house with people that they don't know at all. What do you think happened to them as a couple? Fighting about money and divorced. So oddly enough, you'd think you'd fight less about money when you had more. Turns out not to be the case. It's like you used to fight about what movie to see, and now it's like, what island should we buy? 
But in any case, you're still fighting about the money. And they actually ended up getting divorced. Lottery winners use this uh, word that is a very sad word uh, <laughs> with reference to each other. And the word is upgrade. <laughs> so you think, well, this person was fine when I had you know, a regular amount of money. But now that I'm rich, I could probably do a little bit better. And the saddest thing is that both people are thinking about the other person at the same time. <laughs> So think about their lives. So uh, they had a great life, and now all, a lot of the things that were great in their life have been disrupted by winning the money. I'm not saying that everyone who wins the lottery ends up miserable. Of course not. There are ways to do it where you end up perfectly fine. But I want to highlight that for a lot of lottery winners, what happens is that um, the money sort of overtakes them, in a sense. So you think that it's like money will make you happy. But in fact, obviously, what matters is what happens with the money and what you do with the money. And it's just not usually the way that we think about it. But, and it's obvious when I say it out loud, and yet that's not typically how we live our lives. But the other reason I wanted to show you this um, news article is uh, a friend of ours said, did you see the article? And we said, yeah, we're super vain. Of course we saw it. And they said, did you read the comments that people are typing in? And we said, we did not. And the reason we said that is because you should never read the comments that people type in on articles on the internet. So the internet, to me, I'm old enough that I remember there was no internet. And the internet is like, so there's information that appears on a page. And then very crazy people type a great deal of stuff underneath them. <laughs> Typically much, much longer than the original information, <laughs> actually. That's kind of what it is. So we said, we did not look at those. And they said, you have to look at what people are typing. So we did. And it turns out, so remember the article is called um, Winning the Lottery, Does It Guarantee Happiness? Question mark. And it's a very sad article. And what people started typing in the comments is how amazing it would be if they won the lottery. <laughs> so, so they totally missed the point of the article, and they just went to like fantasy lottery world. And I want to show you two real people that actually typed these things in, and I promise I didn't make them up. These are actual people who took time out of their day to type this on the internet. Here's one of them. This person wrote, when, not if, when I win, I am going to buy my own little mountain and have a little house on top. It was their number one dream in the world, is to be alone at the top of a mountain. <laughs> and then here's the, I'll, I could show these all day, but I'll just show one more. And again, I promise you this is real. This person wrote, I would fill a big bathtub with money, and this is not a typo, by the way, and get in the tub <laughs> while smoking a big fat cigar and sipping a glass of champagne. Pretty weird already. Then I'd have a picture taken and dozens of 8x10 glossies made. Anyone begging for money or trying to extort from me would receive a copy of the picture and nothing. <laughs> so these, <laughs> again, these are real humans that could be here today is the scary thing. But uh, these are extreme examples. I don't mean to say this is the most common sort of thing we see. But if you look across both of those, you can see that one person thought, I'm going to get a house for myself and be alone with my stuff. And this person not only is alone in their tub, surrounded by their money, but they're actually taunting other people with the money. That's like their number one dream with money is to taunt other people. And that's typically what we see, actually, when we look at lottery winners, is the, what they do with the money is they buy stuff, and it's for themselves. It's like the number one thing. It's like a new house, a new boat, a new car. That's what they do. And the problem is, actually, that um, it's not that that makes us unhappy, actually, if you look at the data. It's just that it does nothing for us. So if you look at the relationship between, so if I asked you right now, tell me your spending over the last month, and I had as a category the percent you spent on stuff for yourself. It's a big number, because of course we have to buy stuff for ourselves, like food, but still, that's kind of a big category. And the relationship between that and your overall happiness with your life is none. It's not bad, so it's actually not that people who spend a lot on themselves are miserable, which is what we sometimes think. It's just nothing, it's like a world of nothingness. So money you spend on yourself has no happiness payoff at all. And it's even true for the big things we buy. So for example, this is going to be hurtful for some of you. The size of your house is completely uncorrelated with how happy you are with your life. This will be painful for a different set of you. How nice your car is is completely uncorrelated with how happy you are with your life. It's not negative. It's not like big cars, nice cars and big houses are bad. It's just this world of nothingness. And the problem is that those are the two biggest purchases that most people make. So the bulk of our money is spent on stuff with no emotional payoff. The good news is, again, it's not bad. But the bad news is that it's not good. And I'm going to come back. And I know you don't believe me about the house and the car things. So I'm going to come back to it as to why they don't pay off in happiness. But it's not because they're not nice. If you ask people with nice houses, do you have a nice house, 
They say yes. It just doesn't affect their overall happiness with their life in the way they thought. And I'll come back to why that is uh, in a few minutes. All right, that ends the depressing portion of the talk, which is a lot of what we do is not having a big payoff for us. And Liz and I thought um, about 10 years ago, well, are there other things we can do instead that might actually have a bigger payoff um, emotionally? Uh, and it turns out there are. And the real question is, well, why? So what, what's the psychology underlying why some categories are better than others? Uh, and then how can we build that into our everyday lives and into our spending? So I'll just talk about three. There are more. I'm sure there are lots more that we haven't identified. But these three come up again and again as reliable predictors of happiness. Buying experiences with your money, buying time with your money, and then investing in other people. So buying experiences is interesting because we've, if you think about buying stuff for yourself, you can think like, well, what's the opposite of stuff for yourself? And one opposite is kind of like experiences for yourself. Stuff is a physical thing. Experiences go away. Maybe experiences would make you happier. Put on like a cynical, skeptical hat for a second, and you might say, that's impossible. Because when you buy stuff, you have it, and you can keep enjoying it. Whereas when you buy an experience, like a vacation or a dinner out, it's gone. So you can't enjoy it anymore afterwards. So there's no way that experiences could beat stuff for overall happiness. And it turns out they do for really interesting reasons. And one of the cool things is they're actually better for you even before they happen. So um, just for sake of example, like think about buying a $2,000 TV or a $2,000 vacation. And they're coming up. You don't have it yet, but they're coming. The number one emotion that people report experiencing when they're waiting for stuff to arrive, like a TV, and think of it for yourself, is frustration. Like, I want it. <laughs> Where is my, and you're mad at Amazon, you know, because they haven't given you what you need. The number one emotion that people report when they're waiting for a vacation to come up is anticipation. Like, yeah, you want your vacation to start tomorrow. Of course, we all do. But anticipation is actually a positive emotion. You're excited about what's coming to you. There's a super cool study that I love where they ask people the week before their vacation, the week of their vacation, and the week after their vacation, every day, how happy are you? What do you think for many people was the happiest day? The day before they left. It's kind of weird. Because you don't buy a vacation for the day before the vacation. The whole point is the vacation. But if you look at why, it turns out that when it's the day before, think of your own day before your vacation. It, you're stuck in your cubicle at work, but in your mind, you are on the beach. And what's amazing is that it's perfect. <laughs> the weather is perfect. You look amazing in your bathing suit. <laughs> the other people also are very attractive. <laughs> so it's like a peak experience, actually, the day before. You're also looking around like, I'm going to be on the beach tomorrow, and you idiots are still going to be stuck at work, which is nice. The vacation itself is nice, actually. So people are happier on their vacation than they are in general. It's not like you're not happy on vacations. But it's actually the day before that is the peak for many people. And that's important, because if you think about, like, should I buy a TV or should I buy this vacation, you should count the day before in the decision, which is, again, weird, except it's regular. We know that before experiences, we have a lot of excitement beforehand. And so you should factor it in. OK, so what about during experiences? Well, it turns out that during is way better as well. This one's easier. So uh, again, let's do TV and uh, vacation. Uh, people who buy a TV, um, basically, if you think about <laughs> what happens, uh, we did some surveys of people who were going to buy a really nice TV. I don't um, like to rely on gender stereotypes in general, but there is a gender that is highly interested in televisions and a gender that is less interested in televisions. We can say which one. So, so we asked these uh, men who are very interested in buying an enormous television for some reason. Like, this wouldn't be big enough. This is still not <laughs> large enough. We need it further and higher. Uh, why, what do you want to do with the TV? And they said things like, and some of them were probably lying, but they actually really meant this, I think. We're going to have people over. We'll watch you know, sports together. We'll have family movie night and watch very sad movies and talk about our feelings after. <laughs> and if you, <laughs> if you look at what people do when they buy a TV, uh, you basically spend money on a box that you put on your wall. And you sit in a chair in front of the box by yourself for thousands of hours. That's what buying a TV actually does for most people, no matter what you tell yourself in your mind. I'm aware that some of the things on the box are very good. I'm not saying that they're not. 
but compare the experience of sitting by yourself and watching a wall to going out for an experience with friends and family that's more interesting, more emotionally compelling. Massages are also great and things like that as well. So you can see why during uh, experiences beat stuff. But the coolest thing for us actually is experiences are also better afterward. And this one's really hard actually because this is the one where you say, well, wait a minute, the TV's still around so I can enjoy it, whereas the vacation disappeared and so that's not good. But it's actually because the vacation disappears that it's better. So if you've ever bought a really nice new TV or boat or anything like that, you know that the day after you buy it, it's worth like half what it was. And even worse, like, the, like you spend a year finding the very best TV in the world, and then you buy it, and the very next day they release one that's slightly better. Like it has four more pixels of something. I don't really understand what the metrics are. And now your TV is terrible. And even worse, like your neighbor gets that one, and now you just are like, ugh, well, I have a terrible TV because of, because of their other TV. With experiences, we can't actually compare them very well at all. So imagine we both uh, went on a vacation to Paris, and I come back and you come back, and we try to compare our experiences to each other. We can't do it. Like, I can't measure the way I can with the size of a TV how good your vacation was. So it turns out that both people think their Paris vacation was better, which is wrong. <laughs> One of them was actually better. But it's right because now each of us goes away feeling happy. Remember that um, vacation study I told you about week before, week during, week after? There's another study that I love as well where they did the same thing with people's honeymoons. The week before your honeymoon, how happy are you? The week of. Then they did the week after, but then like a month after, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years after. How good was your honeymoon? So uh, the week before, if you ask people like, how do you feel about your honeymoon? They're very excited about it. And they say like, you know, well, it's going to be amazing. Like, we're going to be on the beach and there's going to be like a sunset with dolphins jumping <laughs> and music and we're going to have like red wine and our arms will be intertwined and we'll be looking at each other's eyes and falling more deeply in love at every moment. And then the honeymoon happens and they're okay, um, but like things happen, you know, like the weather's not great or the flight was delayed or you're arguing about stuff or you find out about an ex that you weren't told about before. <laughs> All kinds of things can happen on honeymoons. So they're not actually as good as what you thought they were. There's that before thing that happens again. If you ask people the week of, they're like, it's, it's good, but not great. Week after, good, good, good. Month, year, five years, 20 years later, people are like, it was amazing. Every moment we were on the beach with our arms intertwined with a red wine. And the, and the reason for that is that our minds are built that we forget negative stuff. We don't know why, actually, but it is the case. This is why old people often walk around extremely happy because they've forgotten how terrible everybody was. Uh, and we remember positive things, which means actually that um, unlike TVs and stuff that get worse objectively over time, experiences get better over time because they disappear. In fact, it's a good thing that they're gone because now we can't compare them to each other, uh, to other things at all, and we just can enjoy them. This is um, the idea of the experiential CV. A colleague of mine at HBS, Anat Keenan, does research where she looks at, so this is um, a Tough Mudder race. Has anybody done a Tough Mudder race? A lot of dudes working something out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So the Tough Mudder race is this crazy race. It's like five or 10 kilometers often. You run through mud and ice water and there's like electric shocks. All sorts of terrible things happen to you during it. And you pay them to let you do this. <laughs> and her question was, well, why? And she has this idea of an experiential CV or an experiential resume where, um, in a sense, the experiences we have in life make us who we are. And so we're kind of trying to, we're trying to think, like, am I having an interesting and productive life? And we try to fill it with experiences to figure out who we are. And we just can't do that with stuff. Like, someone can say to you, let me tell you about the first time I went to Paris and tell you about the story. But it's very rare for someone to be like, let me tell you about the first TV I ever bought. <laughs> so they could. <laughs> But it's probably never happened because that's not who we are. We don't see our old possessions as reflective of who we are, whereas experiences actually build us up and make us um, who we are today. So if you really think about stuff versus experiences, on so many psychological dimensions, experiences beat stuff. OK, um, the next principle I want to talk about is this idea of buying time um, rather than um, using our money on stuff as well. Uh, and I want to come back to why houses and cars don't make us happy. So. Um, it turns out that when you buy a new house, so think of uh, in life as you get older, 
At one time, you probably live in a small place. Then you get a job and you live in a larger place. Then you get a raise, larger place, larger place. You get older, larger, larger, larger. And you end up going from a tiny place to do a very large house, if you're lucky. But at least for most people, the size of where they live gets bigger as they get older. There's nothing wrong with that. Nice, big places are nice, and nice places are nice. But the problem is, and you know this, that big houses are typically not located in a particular place, which is right next to where you work. Uh, so younger people uh, tend to live closer to work, and older people with houses tend to live further. And the reason, therefore, that houses don't pay off in more happiness, it's not that the house itself isn't great. It's that you bought yourself a commute. And you know that. I mean, we're not idiots. We know we bought a commute. But we don't understand how bad commutes are for our well-being is the problem. So we did a survey where we asked people to um, rank a bunch of activities. Uh, among them were commuting and going to the dentist. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that um, commuting is better than going to the dentist, but only slightly. So imagine I said, you can move to that house over there if you want, no problem. The only trick is um, every morning for 30 minutes, dentist. And every evening when you come home, dentist again. <laughs> every day <laughs> for the rest of your life. That's like what buying a house in the suburbs is. Uh, people would, might change their decision. I, don't, I have nothing against dentists. I'm just saying it's not people's most uh, pleasurable experience. So what you have is the house is better, but the commute is worse. And that's why you end up in this world where you're not any happier. They cancel each other out. So what do people do? They say, well, I'm going to be in the car a lot. I should buy a nicer car. <laughs> There's this phrase like throwing good money after bad, which, which comes to mind. So you're thinking, well, I'll be driving. If I have a nice car, it's going to solve the problem. One problem it doesn't solve is no matter how nice your car is, commuting is time away from your family and your friends and the things you like best. So no matter what kind of car you have, that is lost time for you. And the other problem is that when people, you know the vacation, like it's going to be perfect? When people think about a car, they also conjure up this like uh, open road highway thing, like through the mountains. I was going to say wind flowing through your hair, but that's hurtful for me. So, so not that <laughs> wind through your glasses or something. But in fact, when you drive in the morning and in the evening to work, when you commute, there's traffic. So it is true that a nice car is better than a not nice car. But when you're going very slowly and honking and getting mad, it doesn't matter that much. So again, nice cars are nicer, but what comes with it is not always nice, and they end up canceling each other out. So we really try to think about ways in which the money that you spend um, influences your time and really factoring it in. So rather than saying, yeah, there's a commute, but the house is really nice, really understanding what's going to happen on the commute and what you're giving up is a way of understanding whether it's a good purchase or not. The last thing I'll say about buying time is we've done research on, on uh, what's the best pet to buy. And there are many theories in the world about what's the best pet. And I don't want to get into all of them because people get upset. But there are two main theories. Uh, and I'm going to call them like the dog theory and the goldfish theory. And the goldfish theory is it's easy. It's like the easiest pet, because you just put it in a thing and feed it once in a while, and then it like dies in a week anyway. <laughs> the dog theory is very different. It's like dogs are active, and they run around, and they do all this stuff, and they have them for a long time, and all these sorts of things. Uh, and one view of what's the better pet is, well, a fish takes less time. So that's a better pet. And many of you have this theory. So that's a better pet than a dog. A dog takes more time. But if you actually think about how they change your time, it can change the way you think about the decision. So just for example, one of the things that dogs like to do, if you know a dog, is go for walks, which means that when you buy a dog, you commit yourself to exercising a little bit every day, which is good for you. And you could not walk them if you don't want, but terrible things happen in your home. <laughs> so it's a commitment device, in a sense, to get out. And the other great thing about dogs is, if, again, if you know a dog, one of their favorite things in the world is other dogs. Like if they see another dog, they would like to go and, and I guess they chat, I'm not sure, with the other dog. And attached to the other dog by a leash is a person, which means that you commit yourself to chatting with other people as well. And it turns out that actually chat, even small talk with other people, is a better source of happiness than, again, sitting by yourself and staring at your goldfish. So even on a decision like which pet you buy, mapping out the full range of how it affects your time Dogs are also more expensive than goldfish as well. But you're, you're not thinking so much just about the money or about how easy it is, but how these decisions will really influence the time that you spend and whether it's better or worse. And then the last principle that I wanted to talk about is something that we called um, investing in others. This is an idea of one opposite of buying stuff for yourself is buying experiences for yourself. And another opposite is kind of instead of buying for yourself all the time, try buying for somebody else. And I know a lot of you thought when I said $20, 
uh, I, would, I would use it on somebody else. So we know this is true. We just tend to not do it as much as could make us um, uh, happy. So we do um, really fun, what we think are really fun experiments where in order to figure out what makes you happiest, we literally just give people money and tell them to go spend it in different ways. And then we call them and say, are you happy? And then we just rank them. And we were like, well, that didn't make people happy. Let's not tell them to do that. And that seemed to, so let's tell people to do more of that. So in one experiment that we ran um, in Vancouver, uh, we, uh, uh, with college undergraduates actually, at 9 a.m. we went out on campus and we said, here's an envelope. Uh, we said, will you be in our experiment? And because they're undergraduates, they said, sure, because they have nothing to do. And then we gave them an envelope. And some people, it said, slip of paper that said, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on a bill and expense or a gift for yourself. Those are like the personal people. And other people, there was a slip that said, um, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on a charitable donation or a gift for somebody else. Those are like the pro-social people. And the only other thing that we varied was how much money we gave them. So some people got $5 and some people got $20. In the uh, US, I often have to explain that this is not monopoly money, <laughs> that Canada is a real nation to our north with their own currency. And then I ask people to guess who that lady is. And sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> you, you probably know a little bit better. So four groups of people, five for yourself, 20 for yourself, five for somebody else, 20 for somebody else. And then we just call them up that evening and say, what'd you spend the money on, and how happy are you? It's as simple as that. Uh, and you can think of, let's put on skeptical, cynical hat again. First off, like $20 is better than five, so probably those people are happier than, 20 are better, happier than five. And also, like really cynical hat, $20 of free stuff for yourself is awesome. So surely those people are like, that was an amazing day, I got 20 free dollars. The harder one is like, well, actually maybe using the money on somebody else and ending up with nothing could actually make you happier. So let me tell you what people bought. Uh, so in the personal um, version where they spent on themselves, Liz co always calls this tchotchke. Uh, they're college students, so they bought little trinkets of stuff and things like that. In the pro-social or spend on others um, version, they bought very different stuff. So one woman bought a stuffed animal for her niece. Lots of people gave money to homeless people and to street performers. You might be thinking, because you're smart people, well, maybe it's just that buying stuffed animals makes you happier than buying makeup. So what we really want is everyone to buy the exact same thing, but have some of them consume it themselves and some of them give it away as a, as a really strong test of whether it's you or others that makes you happy. Well, that's how we should have set it up, but we didn't. But luckily, undergraduates did it for us. So if you give college undergraduates $5 at 9 AM, and what do you think they do? Coffee, like crazy coffee. <laughs> And there was a Starbucks near where we ran the experiment. So they basically like ran screaming to Starbucks to try to get themselves the coffee. But the cool thing is some of them got it and drank it, and others got it and gave it to somebody else. Again, drinking your own coffee, great, free, awesome coffee. Getting a coffee and then giving it to someone else and watching them drink it, you're like, that was my coffee. Like, maybe that doesn't make you happier. But what we find in this study and in lots of studies is that um, people who spend on themselves are no happier at the end of the day. So it's this world. It doesn't make you unhappy. It just does nothing for you. But people who spend on others are actually happier. And the amount of money doesn't seem to matter that much. Now, we have not given people like a million dollars to spend on themselves over the course of one day. I have a feeling you'd be happy at the end of the day. So I'm not saying spending on yourself never makes you happy, of course. But it does seem pretty regular that spending on yourself doesn't pay off as much uh, as spending on somebody else. OK, so that was um, college students uh, in Canada. People rightly asked us, well, I mean, those people have amazing lives already. So everything is all taken care of. So maybe it feels good to them to give it away rather than spend on themselves. What about people who are really struggling to make ends meet? Uh, and so we worked with some collaborators in Uganda, which is different from Canada in a lot of ways, of course. But in one of the ways, it's a very poor country. And we did really the exact same experiment. So the 10,000 Ugandan shillings is about the same purchasing power as $20 Canadian at the time. So we asked people, think of a time you spent on yourself or somebody else. Uh, and then we saw how happy it made people. I want to show you some examples of what people from the two countries told us about spending on other people, uh, in part because uh, what you see is that people, because people are people everywhere in the world, you see a lot of similarities, which is interesting. So here's two, two guys uh, who we asked, um, think of a time you spent money on somebody else. So this guy, this is like a 19-year-old guy from Uganda. <laughs> he says, I called a girl I wish to love. I think he means romantically. <laughs> he says, we went to, uh, this is a restaurant, and I bought her dinner, which was about $20 <laughs> Canadian. But however, <laughs> I did not achieve this girl up to now. Again, I think romantically, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Here's a guy from Canada. 
I took my girlfriend out for dinner at a local restaurant. We went to a movie, which was so bad we left, and then went back to her room for any guesses? Keep it clean? Just cake. <laughs> So neither of them achieved the, uh, the girl up to now. So we see lots of similarities um, <laughs> across the two countries. But as you can imagine, we see really stark differences as well. I'll just show you two more. Uh, this is a, you can tell what country people are from pretty quickly. This is a woman from Canada who's in her 30s. And she says, I went to, I went to the mall uh, and got a scarf for my mom. It's definitely pro-social, like we should all buy more presents for our mom. It's probably not a life-changing event. Her mother probably had other scarves. So it's, it's nice, but it's not huge. Compare that to this example from Uganda. This is a woman also in her 30s who says, on Sunday I was walking and I met a friend whose son had malaria. Uh, the father actually had lost his job, so they had no money, and they'd lost their home, and she needed to visit a clinic. I gave her about the equivalent of a scarf for medical bills and transport. It's about as close as you can come to saving someone's life with $15 or $20. What we find in both countries, number one, we see many examples like this in Uganda, and of course very few in Canada, that are really meeting a basic need. What's fascinating for us, at least, is that in both countries, even people struggling to meet their basic needs, spending on themselves does not uh, relate to happiness. It's still this world. And in both countries, spending on others is associated with more happiness. What was also fascinating for us is that if you thought about which of these two would have a bigger emotional payoff, getting a scarf that someone doesn't need or saving someone's life, your intuition is correct that saving someone's life uh, has a bigger impact than a scarf. But make up a scale for a second. If spending on yourself is here, scarf is here for happiness, and then saving someone's life is like here. You might think it's like 80 more floors up, right? Like saving someone's life. And the reason I say that is because um, it matters how you spend on other people for sure. But what really seems to matter is that you spend on other people. Sometimes people are like, well, you said to spend, but should I buy like a friend dinner, or should I give to a local charity, or should I give to a third world charity? Well, you know, how should I do it? And just remember, like, yes, you should think carefully about how you spend on others, but the big thing is like quit spending on yourself, and you'll have a bigger emotional payoff. Okay, um, so the last thing I just wanted to mention um, briefly, because this is research we've been doing the last few years, um, is uh, how these insights build into the way companies work. Um, and I'll only talk about it in the domain of um, charity, although we've done it in the other domains as well. And I want to be a little unfair to companies just for a second. Um, lots of companies, um, this is not unfair, want to do something nice sometimes. And they say, let's give some money to charity. Uh, so I just made up $100,000. But they take some sum, and they say, let's give it to charity. And very, very typically what happens is the CEO of that company, I can't tell you how common this is, like sees a documentary about something or other, and then says, we need to support that cause. And it could be a super random cause. <laughs> But now the CEO is excited, and he or she says, we are supporting saving the whales. And they give the money to save the whales. And then the employees get an email that's like, we just saved the whales. And the employees are like, really? <laughs> like, why the whales? When did this happen? Or there's like ads on TV that are like, hey, we saved the whales. And customers are like, I guess that's cool. I don't know what whales had to do with anything. And the biggest problem for us with this model is, and I set it up this way so you can see it, is um, only one person gets to give. And the one person is the CEO. But we know that even when individuals give tiny amounts of money, like 5 or $20, it has a big emotional impact. You can already guess what the next slide is going to look like. We just rejigger the process, where rather than have the CEO give directly, we split the money among the employees. And then not only do they get to give, but they can choose the charity that they care most about. We did an experiment actually uh, here uh, a few years ago with National Australia Bank and a nonprofit called Karma Currency. Uh, you would show up to work one day as an employee of National Australia Bank, and you had Karma Currency in your inbox, like $25 to give to charity. And uh, you can give to whatever charity you want. And then we measured how happy people were with the experience and their job satisfaction as well. It's pretty amazing. So Karma Currency comes in and gives a presentation saying, like, here's what all of you did as an organization today, and it's like you gave this much money to breast cancer research, you saved this many acres of rainforest, people are looking around like, I thought you were all jerks, but I guess we're really nice. It's a really meaningful experience. And we show that not only are people happier, but their job satisfaction goes up as well. And then we can do, this is the last study I'll talk about, we can do the exact same thing with customers. So rather than the company giving directly, customers get to give uh, the money directly. This is a project we did with um, the home goods retailer Crate and Barrel. 
uh, and a nonprofit, U.S.-based nonprofit called Donors Choose that um, is for public school teachers from low-income school districts who can post projects. So if their school district can't afford a certain book or certain art supplies, they post it, and you and I can go on and buy it directly. Crate and Barrel does things like, um, here's $25 off your next purchase if you come to the website, the usual marketing stuff, and that stuff works. I'm a marketing person. But they also did one where they said, thanks for being our customer. Here's $25 to give to donors choose. No strings attached. And we look to see who comes back faster to Crate and Barrel to buy something, and it's the people who got the donors choose gift card rather than people who got money off their next purchase. And they say things like Crate and Barrel is an organization that reflects my values. Really simple change. It's the same amount of money going to charity in any case. We're just changing the process so that individual people can be uh, more involved. So um, these are the principles again. Again, I think there are more, but these are um, three that come to mind a lot in terms of rethinking about how you spend your uh, money and particularly how that relates to experiences, time, and invest in others. And if you remember um, nothing else, just remember this pretty cheesy phrase, but it's still true. Um, if you think money can't buy happiness, you're just not uh, spending it right. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Nice. That, was, uh, that was amazing. And uh, as an owner of an expensive car, house, a dog, and a 30-minute <laughs> commute, I'm now a little bit uh, I'm wondering what I'm going to do. But um, guys, <laughs> um, and I've got a goldfish too, actually, for oh. that matter. Um, uh, so guys, uh, now we've got about um, 10 minutes of Q&A. So um, what we'd love to do is, if you are going to ask a question, if you can just stand up, because we do have an online community, um, just state your name and in a loud voice ask the question. But um, by all means, we've got, uh, we've got 10 to 15 minutes of questions, so I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, has anyone going to open the account? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name's Anne-Marie. When you did the study with the employees of the organisation that donated $25, did you do any follow-up to see if that had any impact on their giving behaviour? So did they, were they more encouraged to give from their own account? Uh, it's a great question. So um, we don't know. So one worry with doing these kinds of initiatives is in fact that people will substitute. So well, now that I gave $25 of my company's money, I don't need to give any more of my own money because I'm already done which would not be good for charities. Um, we do have a little evidence that, um, so not everyone um, takes up the offer. Some people get the email that says give money to charity and they delete it. It is the case that um, people who already give to charity are more likely to click on the let me give more to charity, which suggests that it's kind of part of a giving habit. But we haven't done the, the nice experiment that you have in mind, which is can we actually give people a little charitable boost and then show that it turns them into givers uh, over time. But I love the idea. Where's down the back? Uh, Wesley Adol from AMP. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with superannuation, but one of the things with super is that you basically sacrifice your money today for your future. I'm just wondering, are any of these principles um, applicable for your future self when we're trying to talk to people about spending on their future self? Yeah, it's a great question. So we um, work with a um, bank on retirement accounts, actually. And one of the ideas uh, for, so the typical model of saving for retirement is like um, you should save enough money so that you don't run out before you die, <laughs> which is not very motivating, <laughs> as it turns out. And it's a huge bummer for people. And it's also scary. So if you think of like motivating people to do good things, Fear and depression are, are not typically good for long-term change. So one of the things that we've done actually is tried to build people's um, retirement accounts into aspirational goals. So very simply, we can. So I, I mentioned that um, giving to others makes people happy, and buying experiences makes people happy. So we have people basically save. They label their accounts themselves and save into those accounts. So for example, someone might say, "Well, you know, my wife and I have always wanted to go and travel in Europe." and I really want to pay for my grandkids' college education. So they have, they have really one retirement account, but it's bucketed in those two buckets. And now if they're not saving enough, it's like they're cheating their grandchild because the account's not filling up in the way they wanted to. And in the old world, they wanted to do that, but it was kind of going into a big fund and it was very nebulous. So all we're trying to do is get people to think more about specifically what they're saving for as they go. And the other thing we try to get them to do is make sure they're saving into accounts that when they spend them later, they'll really make them happy. 
So we know that in, when you turn 65, if you're saving up, for example, for a house, I know that that's not going to make you that happy. So I can advise you, maybe you should think about saving up for something else that will make you happy. So we want to have people both saving for goals that are emotionally meaningful, and then also when they spend, when they come to that point, that it'll have a big payoff for them as well. And we do find that people like the product more when they're saving for things that they deeply care about, and it helps them save a little bit more. Way back. Ben from AMP. So don't, don't you think there's a counter argument that marketers would say that things do make people happy because otherwise why do brands and things like that matter? Uh, yes, so I think uh, you sound like one of my colleagues at Harvard Business School. <laughs> I think uh, one of my colleagues, uh, I was giving a talk uh, on campus and he didn't know that I was walking behind him and he said, um, now we have to go listen to the socialist tell us how to spend our money. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. <laughs> so I think, um, I think uh, it's true that uh, things can certainly have an emotional payoff for us. If you look at the time course, and one question is like, well, if, it, if it's this world, why do we keep doing it? Right? Like, what, w why wouldn't we change to something else? But if you look at the time course of spending on stuff, it's not that it doesn't make us happy. It's that it doesn't last. So even over the course of a day, so for, even in the buy a coffee for yourself or give it to somebody else example, which is a trivial one, but let's stick with that for a second, it's not that when you get a free coffee and drink it yourself, you're not really happy. You definitely are. And it's not that the day after you buy a new car and you're sitting in it and it has a new car smell, you're not happier. You definitely are. But the problem is that it very, very soon becomes part of the background of your life, and so it doesn't pay off in more happiness. So it's almost like uh, the analogy we sometimes use is it's almost like drugs a little bit where they have an amazing initial kick and then they quickly sort of wear off. Whereas the other things I've talked about like spending on others and buying experiences and even buying time, they often in the moment don't have a very good payoff. So some people report when they're spending on other people, like if someone comes into your office and they're going to run some race or something and they're like, will you sponsor me in the race? And you're like, well, I, I mean, I can't say no now. He's <laughs> standing right here. And they leave, and you're like, ah, you know, like, I, I didn't want to do that. So in the moment, it actually doesn't have a strong payoff. But later on, it turns out that it sums up to a happier life. So I think I didn't talk a lot about the time course of different purchases. But that's part of the problem for us, is that some things pay off in the short term, and some things only pay off in the longer term. And we're way better at maximizing short-term happiness than we are at longer term happiness, like the last question about saving for retirement. It's much better to do something for myself today than something for myself in 10 years. So yeah, it absolutely isn't the case that things can't have an emotional payoff. And it's not the case that we're saying you should not buy anything for yourself. But typically what we find is that people are spending more of their budget on that than they should or could. And if they shift some of it to these other categories, they'd be happier with their lives. Thank you. And Michael, just to build on that a little bit, so do you think it's true because there's a lot of people that want to give socially, um, whether it's give to charities or so forth, and I know even one of the promotions we're running here at work is um, we're asking someone to do something, give up a little bit of their time, and in return we'll actually donate a little bit of money to charity. Yeah. Um, I'm a, based on the talk that you've given, I'm now questioning whether or not people would know that would lead to happiness or whether it's just done after the fact. Yeah, um, uh, it's a great question. So volunteering is very psychologically complicated, as it turns out. So giving to charity is nice because it's easy. It, I mean, it might be hard to give up money, but it's easy in practice, because you just click things and then it goes. Whereas volunteering, you have to do stuff, which is not as good <laughs> for most of us, because we'd rather not do stuff. Uh, <laughs> let's be honest. It's like, I know I should go build homes for people who don't have homes, but it is very cold out. Mm. So I would rather, I would rather <laughs> not go. One of the things that we've worked on a lot with volunteering is, so we worked with um, a firm in the UK, a consulting firm that was trying to redesign volunteering opportunities. And uh, they were, one of the clients they had was an accounting firm. And the um, charity they were supporting was a, one of these build, your, build houses for, for low income people. And they found that uptake was at like zero among the accountants. And they started to feel like, I guess our employees are jerks. Because what kind of a person doesn't help people in need? And what they were forgetting, of course, was that they were accountants. And I don't mean to stereotype accountants either, but accountants typically are not like handy people who enjoy hammering things. <laughs> they tend to like sort of computers and spreadsheets. 
uh, and this is not just my opinion, we asked them, what do you like to do? And they, and they told us, I like to work with numbers. That's why they're accountants. So um, we thought, well, rather than say, like, you know, building houses is a good thing to do, you should do it. Let's think of what they enjoy doing and see if we can find places where they can enact what they enjoy doing for volunteering opportunities. And what we came up with was, and it's very simple actually, is helping low-income people file their taxes. And they loved it, actually. It's like a game. You know what I mean? They, so literally they would come in on weekends and help low-income people file their taxes because it was something they already loved doing. It wasn't that they didn't want to help people. It's just they were like, I don't know how to hammer a thing, so why would I go do that? So with volunteering, we really try to think very carefully about what it is that, it's not um, necessarily what you want to help, it's what you like doing. And then can we find a way where that will then translate into you, um, you know, going out and actually volunteering? But we haven't gotten there yet. I mean, volunteering uptake at all companies is very low mm. because it's just a little bit harder to do than give to charity. Mm. I like what you guys do by combining them. So there's like another nice incentive for being nice to begin with. Mm. Um, that, that's an interesting way to think about the problem. Well, we'll let you know how we go. Yeah. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. It has to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> is it? You didn't say no, so it's got to be. <laughs> Um, Dong Wa from AMP Capital. Um, so just using your example of um, receiving or, or getting a lottery win, uh, what about inheritances? Um, in a similar fashion, it's a sad event, unless you don't like the person that just died. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and on the other hand, the person who's, well, if they know they're about to die, would they think about their own happiness and start saying, I'll, I'll start donating to charity? Hmm. And I'll leave you a note in the box and it says, look, I've just given money to cancer and th I've just given that away. Yeah. Or would you, have you heard of people doing the other way, which is what you've suggested, which is instructing whoever is receiving the money to actually give things away? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we've studied, um, inheritances are a very interesting kind of money uh, because in a sense it's just money. All money is money, but it has this really powerful emotional tag to it. Uh, one thing we've seen actually is that um, to the extent that money predicts how happy you are, uh, money you inherited does not, and money you earned does. So there's, there's no sort of payoff in life for inheriting money for at least your happiness, because there's something about earning it yourself that seems to matter a lot. The other thing that's cool about inheritance actually is so people, they like, somebody dies and leaves them money and they're like, oh, I can't, I can't spend this on like something stupid, like I, because it's not cool. And so what, the, what they do is they like um, launder it into their regular accounts <laughs> and then spend different money out of the, not the inheritance money, but the other money out of that to buy like a stupid product that they really wanted or something like that. Uh, and then to your, the second part of your question, um, we have found that um, when people instruct people how to use the money, so I'm leaving you this money and what I want you to do with it is this, this, and this, that's when lawsuits happen, <laughs> uh, as it turns out. So people are very averse to someone saying, I'm leaving you money, but here's what you should do with it. So we suggest, actually, that if you want your money to go to charity, don't rely on your heirs to, to do it, but do it preemptively uh, before you're gone so that you can give where you really want it to. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Very good. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going um, to leave Craig with this thought that he's got to somehow go to the shareholders and convince them that giving us more money will make them more happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, guys. I um, really appreciate your time. And a special thanks again to Michael, who actually has spent uh, 17 hours getting out here, only for one day to be here with you guys, and, and he's going back another 17 hours. So thanks again. Thank you very much.